John Hemingway, writer and filmmaker. Welcome to the JSO interview. Great to be here. In your own words, why writer and filmmaker? Oh gosh, I think I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, I wrote a book just after university. Somebody read it um, at ABC and I got a job as a production manager and then a writer of a television series in America. That was at the age of about 22, 23. And it's never stopped since. I didn't know anything about cameras. I didn't know anything about filmmaking. And I taught myself on the job and it continues on. Well, going to a point where you've sort of been, in, uh, I think you're being humble here, you're an Emmy um, uh, Award winner, so um, there has been a recognition of your work. Well, thank you, yeah. I, um, I, I think, it, you know, it's so fashionable for every filmmaker to call himself an award-winning filmmaker. And, <laughs> and there are a lot of awards you can get out there, I guarantee you don't have to be very seasoned to get, get one. But um, I know I've been very lucky. I, I think is, if you're in it long enough, you're bound to pick up the awards. I want to get to Kenya, be selfish. Why are you here now? Uh, I'm here really because of elephants. Um, there's no other reason. I have loved elephants ever since I first came to Africa, age 16, who can't. Um, they, you know, at the age of 16, we had it all wrong about elephants. The rumbles we heard from them we thought was just extraordinary gastric pain. Now we understand its language. Um, and in the course of my life, what people like Joyce Poole and Cynthia Moss have, have and Ian Douglas Hamilton have added to the encyclopedia of elephants makes us all realize that they are on this planet uh, offering this planet as much as much grace as any animal alive. Uh, they are here to teach us a whole lot of things and if we're not smart enough to pick up uh, we ought to go back to the drawing boards because they are they can teach us beautiful lessons. Well, they, as a Kenyan, I mean, I, I, I come up with a statistic that since maybe January, uh, maybe close to how many, a thousand of them have been killed for their ivory and this whole issue of poaching. So is it being unkind for me to say that you're making, you're chronicling the end of a species, much as we love it? I hope I'm not. But that was the concern, and that was what propelled me to make this film. It's called Battle for the Elephants, and it all began about a year and a half ago when the statistics were very, very hard to um, overlook. Uh, something like they were saying 20,000 elephants were being killed a year. We now know it's far in excess of 30,000 elephants across Africa. Most of the killing goes unnoticed, unrecorded. It is a holocaust. I hate to use that word, but it is a holocaust against the elephant. And in certain populations, uh, they will be eliminated, extirpa extirpated within a couple of years, if not before. Overall in Africa, if it continues the same way, it's going to be uh, a decade or less. It is horrifying. That's what made me make this film. That's what made me go to the National Geographic Society and say, this is one of the most important things you can do. And that is why I got some wonderful donors to um, immediately come up to the plate and help make this film possible. So what is it about your film in particular? I mean, my research has revealed it has actually persuaded a government, the Philippines to be precise, to have any dealings with so this is, you're saying, the world can be changed through a film, and that's your film. You know, I didn't think that was possible, John. I really didn't think before I went into this it was possible. After this film, I know it is possible. This was a film, and we, we were just acting as pure and simple journalists. I wanted to tell a story of supply and demand. Supply in Africa, something like 400,000 elephants live here demand in Asia. 
Who were they in, in, in Asia buying it? How were the elephants being killed in Africa? And how they traveled between those two continents? That's the story I wanted to tell. I thought everybody knew this story. I thought it was obvious to everybody what was going on. Indeed, it turned out it wasn't obvious. Some of the brightest people in the world didn't have a clue as to what was happening to the elephant. And that's, uh, and that's really why I got involved in it and why the effect has been so profound. You talk about the Philippines. Uh, well, I have to say it's a, it's a very proud moment for all of us. Um, Brian Christie, who was featured in the film, had done an article called Blood Ivory in the National Geographic, and a combination of that and this film um, made the Philippine government change their tune. Um, at first, they wanted to um, imprison um, uh, Brian after his article. Um, and, and months later, they invited him to preside at the destruction of something like five tons of ivory, which was in their stockpile. Uh, it is the first Asian country to accept fault and to destroy its stockpile. In other words, I, I can't estimate how much that would be worth, but I think 10 to 12 million dollars would not be inaccurate. And so they've, it's not a rich country. It's not like China. It's not like Thailand. or It's not a rich country. And they destroyed 12 million dollars. They just set it on fire that day by right. crushing it. Right. We'll come back to some of those countries that you've mentioned mm -hmm. precisely. Yeah, yeah. But I want to come back. If, we, if there's somebody watching this interview who's not going to see the film, and you said some of the brightest people in the world don't know what is happening to the elephant. Is it within you to, to summarize to a mass audience what is happening to the African elephant and the Kenyan elephant in particular? Okay. It's one headline. The Chinese middle class. 90% uh, of all the ivory taken out of Africa goes to China. Now, what is the Chinese middle class? In addition to making the film, or I should say, as we made the film, we realized that we wouldn't really be telling a hard news story unless we really had our facts. And there have been a lot of suppositions about the buyers, who they were, why were they buying, and everything else. So we conducted a survey uh, uh, with an independent group, um, and we we had 600 respondents uh, representing the Chinese middle class. And how we defined the Chinese middle class was anybody earning $32,000 or over a year. a year. That could be a whole fam a household. And all the way up to whatever you want to imagine. We asked them, do you own ivory? 80% of the respondents said yes. Will, do you intend to buy? Do you me? own ivory in the form of a, gold, a trinket? A, well, it could be a, anything. A, a, a sort of. A it could be anything. Yeah. But um, I can I can explain what some yeah. of those trinkets are. Um, uh, the trinkets are. Uh, we've been to so many of these shops. I mean, it could be as simple as a set of chopsticks. That's going to set you back. Two yes. to four hundred dollars, by the way, a set right. of chopsticks made out of ivory, or a chess uh, set. I can I can extrapolate your thinking, and, uh, yeah. and that will cost you slightly more. Uh, slightly more, right. all the way up. Uh, we saw objects that were going for just under a million dollars, and um, a piece of ivory like that, just polished and put on a very beautiful um, ebony stand. Right. Uh, that was about eight thousand dollars. Would somebody seeing your film go so far as to understand? why the attachment to this bit of an animal for people thousands of miles away from where the animal lives, who've never seen the animal, where is it, is it in sort of uh, the, the, the Buddhist mythology? What is it? What is the attachment to ivory? Well, you, you do have a, a background. You have Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism um, that have played a role in this, and they're objects and symbols out of that culture. But I'd have to say that which would suggest that for those who don't know that a long, long time ago there were elephants in China. Is that a conclusion to be made? It is a conclusion. It's also true that there are between two or three hundred elephants left in China. Right. So Few they have people, some of their own. Yes. And guess what? 
They are the best protected elephants in the entire world. Gosh. And so protect our own, yeah, kill other people. Exactly, exactly. Right, right. And, um, and the panda bear falls under that category too right. in China. Right. The most protected other species. Everything else, it's open uh, market on. I, we've had other guests on this uh, forum. We've had Dr. Paula Kahumbu, Dr. Ian Douglas Ham Hamilton, who've addressed this idea. So we, we do know the story from another angle. But the word condemnation, which perhaps people would avoid, you've talked to China, you've said 80% of the people have ch expressions of ivory in their lives and their middle class. Surely the question to ask is, what's being done to them? What kind of sanctions? What kind of punishment? Because otherwise, I, I go back to my earlier hypothesis, you are make, you're chronicling the death of a species. Right. Well, um, this is the tragedy. Um, I was also going to mention that we asked them how many intend to buy ivory in the future. 83% of that, of the population that we uh, targeted, want to buy it. We asked them, how many of you think that some of the ivory you're buying is illegal? 68% responded they knew some of it was illegal. Now, the question you're asking is, if it is illegal, what are the um, uh, uh, consequences, let's say? Yes, because you're suggesting that there's no such thing as government. You're suggesting that there's no such thing as presidents and prime ministers and people who rule and make decisions. Oh, um, I believe that it is, um, it is sanctioned by government because most of the factories that carve it are government owned. So um, the, the, the cruel part of this story is that um, a number of years ago there were some legal sales of ivory to China um, and essentially they have given cover to the illegal sales of ivory and so now if five million tons was sold at one point uh, to them legally, uh, they've gone through that five million tons so fast it would make your head spin. Now uh, they're, go they're, they're consuming it at an incredible rate. Nine, it's a nine billion dollar trade. And we went into some factories, we had a, a tricky time getting into them um, in China. And um, they're modern factories, air conditioned, with people sitting in little cubicles, carving away, the dust is sucked out of the air, that's ivory dust by the way, and there are lots of empty seats in these, in these um, factories. The empty seats are not because people have been fired, the empty seats is because the Chinese government intend to hire some more people to, to, uh, to do this. It is a growth industry. Right, but uh, if you're, uh, the apportioning of blame, because anybody uh, watching us would say, okay, you've picked out the chief culprit. You've mentioned other countries, such as Thailand. You've mentioned, and I do believe that there is, as an American, there is a, a significant trade in ivory in your own country. So are you saying one form of abuse is better than another? Because I do believe I've read a, an expansive tome that chronicles the misuse of ivory in the US. Uh, and maybe it might be second of all to the Chinese. Is that untrue? Um, that part is probably untrue, but what, what I can say to you is that in the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century, there's no doubt that the United States and Western Europe were the chief consumers of ivory. Piano keys, billiard balls, combs, brushes, all sorts of things. It was a huge trade. In fact, there's a little town in Connecticut called Ivoryton, uh, where the, uh, the clipper ships coming out of Zanzibar and other parts of the East African coast brought the ivory. So the answer is, you're absolutely right. Now, the biggest trader right now is China. Right. Thailand following. There is no question that the United States is on the receiving end of that. And there's no question that, that the U.S. is, um, is to blame. And I believe that the first thing that, uh, that should happen is the United States should crack down entirely right. so, on, on this so I would internal say, and I would, I would And say that your film is also going to be distributed in the United States with much the same vigor as it was shown in the Philippines. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right. It will have that. And, and, and since our conversation is limited, I'm also going back to our responsibility. My, myself being a Kenyan, uh, we read in the papers every day that right up to the very top echelons of government, there are people involved in this trade. So apart, I go back to my initial premise. It'll be a very hard luck story, but in much the same way as the dodo, the elephant is going to become extinct. Would you accept that as a premise? It'll take time. People like you are going to work tirelessly to make sure it doesn't happen. But the way things are going, it will. Well, in my few short years left, um, I will dedicate myself to making sure that doesn't happen. Uh, I, I the, what is your chance of success? Uh, because I, because I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not denying the nobility of the cause. I'm just being, what is the word, cynical. Okay. Um, I can tell you how, how successful it could be. In, in 1989, Richard Leakey burnt the ivory in this country. It was a symbolic gesture, that, uh, and the smoke of that ivory burn was uh, traveled all the way to the United, to the United States. It, it affected huge changes in the import of ivory in the United States at the time. But most importantly, it targeted Japan, who were the chief consumers at that time. Now, they did shut the trade down. Uh, today, the trade in what they call hankos, these little seals that they have, has been reduced incredibly. So yes, to answer your question, it is possible. And I, and I think it would be possible in China, because unlike Kenya, unlike the United States, unlike so many other countries, all it takes is a word from the top. The word from the top would be, no more buying or selling of ivory. All the shops that are government owned, and all the other shops, not government owned, no selling of ivory. It would just take one word from the top and it could be done. It's not a magic recipe. But in the meantime, what Kenya must do is it must make it absolutely the most heinous social disease of all times to trade in ivory and to poach elephants. Right, okay, so we're going back. I want to stick to Kenya. I want to stick to Kenya. And I'm th because we hear about world, the layman's perception, uh, organizations like CITES, people in briefcases meet. You're a filmmaker, you're a writer, that's your, but there, there, there are specialists in the field. What are they doing to sort of say, let's have a worldwide ban? Because my, my niggling argument is that you're picking on the big bad wolf, but there are other people having a whale of a time and ex just discussing the topic. The world yeah. hasn't said no to ivory trading, has it? Uh, you know, it is a tragedy. CITES, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, I was there. We showed our film there. Um, they spent a day on elephants, all 280 delegates from around the world. It was a ridiculous discussion they had. It was the mechanics for deciding how to decide to sell ivory in the future. None of them addressed the catastrophic problem facing them at the time. Uh, they, they came up with language that essentially targeted eight countries, the Gang of Eight, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda as the suppliers, um, three countries that were part of the transit route, and the two uh, consumer nations, Thailand and China. And, but as I insufficient, saw it, as I saw it, I thought it was a, in, a little tap on the back of the hand. Right. And, 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 and so what if they find them really um, uh, in breach of uh, whatever agreement they made? What are they going to do? They have no tools to do it. Nothing at all. So I believe you're right. A lot of guys in suits with briefcases, traveling around the world, living in nice hotels, going to conferences and talking about something in a most extraordinarily disconnected way about something that's happening on the ground now. They're not doing it. So I think there's another way to do it. Right. And we, we, time is not on our side. We have to end with, you said, and I was listening, that you're going to de dedicate the rest of your living days to this project. What are you going to do and how are you going to get, educate others such as myself to join you? Well, I think in Kenya uh, there's a great opportunity. Um, I'm, um, I'm very happy I, 
I've just recently um, been appointed the chairman of Wildlife Direct, um, which, uh, and you've interviewed Dr. Paula Kahumbo, um, who is leading the charge. I think the mo it, it is appalling that all the NGOs in the world haven't done what this small little organization is trying to do, and that is to change the hearts and minds of people and to change the laws related to wildlife crime. These are absolutely critical. And, um, and why, why I'm here is to, uh, because uh, Kenya's first lady, the first time this has ever happened, first lady of this country has come out to support this. We think it's a tremendous move. It comes from the very highest. Um, and we believe that it can change. It can be a part of a system that is going to affect other countries. If Kenya can do it, then I think a lot of other African countries will look to this example and will be inspired. John Hemingway, writer and filmmaker, thank you for inspiring us and thank you for coming on the JSO interview. Thank you so much, John.